The topic of today's talk is autoimmune liver disease. I have no financial disclosures relating to the topics discussed in this talk. The main autoimmune diseases can be classified by the target of the attack by the immune system. In autoimmune hepatitis, the main autoimmune target is the hepatocyte. By contrast with primary biliary cirrhosis and primary sclerosing cholangitis, the autoimmune target is the biliary tree, with primary biliary cirrhosis targeting smaller bile ductules than primary sclerosing cholangitis. The target for primary biliary cirrhosis is the interlobular bile ducts and septo bile ducts, while the target for primary sclerosing cholangitis is that of the larger intrahepatic and extrahepatic bile ducts. To begin our discussion, we will describe the epidemiology, clinical features, as well as management of PBC, primary biliary cirrhosis. PBC is a relatively rare disease with a prevalence of 40 to 150 per million. It occurs in all racial groups, but is female predominant, being much less common in men. The median age is 50, and this disease is really characterized as a disease of middle-aged women. The most remarkable feature of this disease is the presence of a positive anti-mitochondrial antibody, or AMA. 95% of patients with PBC have a positive AMA. While fatigue and pruritus are common presenting symptoms of PBC, many patients are asymptomatic at diagnosis. These patients can present with just an isolated elevation of alkaline phosphatase or evidence for cholestatic liver injury. In addition to fatigue and pruritus, PBC is also associated with other findings such as Sicka syndrome, dry eyes, dry mouth, and hepatomegaly. Less common, surprisingly, is jaundice, which occurs late in disease. This is because even though PBC suggests cirrhosis, patients often present without cirrhosis. The presence of xanthalesma, that is cholesterol deposits on the eyelids, and xanthomas, which have been characteristically described for PBC, is actually relatively uncommon. The diagnosis of PBC can be made in the presence of cholestatic liver injury, a positive AMA, and a consistent liver biopsy. It is important to obtain a liver biopsy not just to make the diagnosis, but also to stage the disease. The overall management of PBC can be divided into specific management for PBC, as well as management of the complications associated with PBC. In addition, with advanced disease, we need to direct therapy towards the management of end-stage liver disease and therefore determine whether there should be consideration for liver transplantation. Ursodeoxycholic acid is the only approved therapy for PVC. Ursodeoxycholic acid at 13 to 15 milligrams per kilogram per day delays the progression to end-stage liver disease, delays the progression to need for liver transplantation, enhances survival, and is well tolerated. Therefore, this is recommended for the treatment of PBC in all patients. There have been multiple other therapies tested, but they do not work for PBC, and these include anti-fibrogenic agents such as colchicine, immunosuppressants such as corticosteroids, azathioprine, clambucil, cyclosporin, methotrexate, and thalidomide. Therefore, these agents should not be used in this disease. In addition to specific treatments to stall progression of disease, management of the troubling symptoms of primary biliary cirrhosis are very important. Pruritus, which is a very common feature of this disease, occurs very early in the disease and can be troubling and difficult to treat. Patients often complain of itching of their palms and feet, and this is particularly prominent at night when they're trying to sleep. For mild pruritus, antihistamine can be used safely. However, as pruritus progresses, other methods need to be used. Cholestyramine is the first choice for treatment, usually at doses of 8 to 24 grams per day. It is particularly important to inform your patients that these need to be taken half an hour before they eat. I usually begin with one packet of cholestyramine, which is 4 grams daily, and incrementally increase to two packets twice a day, usually once before breakfast and two before bed. In patients who fail or are intolerant to the side effects of cholestyramine, rifampin should be used as a second-line therapy. This can be very effective, but the only concern is the possibility of hepatotoxicity. Opiate antagonists can also be considered and has been published to be effective, although in my personal experience has not been very positive with this medication. Liver transplantation may be indicated for uncontrollable symptoms, although this is usually considered in only very extreme cases. Another common problem found in PBC is osteopenia and osteoporosis, which affects up to one-third of patients. There is no proven therapy other than liver transplantation, although calcium supplementation and vitamin D supplementation, if needed, should be considered in addition to biphosphonates. Because this is a common feature of the disease, the AASLD guidelines recommend that bone mineral density should be assessed when the diagnosis of PBC is first made, 
and every two years thereafter. Education regarding the importance of lifestyle changes, such as regular exercise, smoking cessation, vitamin D, and calcium supplementation should be given. Hormonal replacement therapy best via transdermal route is recommended when appropriate. If osteoporosis is evident, therapy with a bisphosphonate should be considered. Hypercholesterolemia is also very common in PBC. It can be present up to 85% of patients with PBC. HDL is elevated early in the disease, but as the disease progresses, the LDL also increases. Some of the excess LDL is composed of abnormal lipoprotein, lipoprotein X, and thus it is not clear if this elevated cholesterol increases the risk of coronary artery disease. As such, the decision to treat these patients with lipid-lowering agents is much more difficult and would need to take into account other cardiac risks. Ursodeoxycholic acid is an effective treatment to stall the progression of liver disease, but it does not necessarily stop the progression of disease. Many patients progress to cirrhosis and end-stage liver disease requiring liver transplantation. Liver transplantation in PBC is recommended for patients with liver failure, and one to five year survivals after liver transplantation is excellent at 92 and 85 percent respectively. Thus, transplantation should be considered for appropriate individuals with PBC. Primary sclerosing cholangitis is an autoimmune disease of the liver which targets the medium and large biliary ducts. This disease, in contrast to PBC, is more common in men, with about 70 percent of affected individuals being male with an average age diagnosed at 40. The disease can affect both intra- and extrahepatic bile ducts, with 87% having involvement of both intra- and extrahepatic ducts, and 11% having involvement only of intrahepatic ducts, and 2% having involvement only of extrahepatic ducts. The clinical manifestation can range from asymptomatic patients with abnormal liver function tests to patients who present with fatigue and pruritus. In addition, some patients can present with intermittent fevers, chills, night sweats, and right upper quadrant pain. There is a significant association with ulcerative colitis. In fact, the prevalence of ulcerative colitis and PSC approaches 90% if rectal and sigmoid biopsies are routinely taken. In many incidences, this can be asymptomatic, so a screening colonoscopy is warranted in all cases. The association of PSC and ulcerative colitis leads us to clues for the pathogenesis of these disease. Interestingly, PSC and ulcerative colitis can occur at different times, for example, years after colectomy or after liver transplantation. The gold standard for diagnosis of PSC is an imaging study of the biliary tree, such as ERCP. By contrast, a liver biopsy is rarely diagnostic, although the most specific finding is that of onion skin pattern seen as sclerosing around bile ducts. This lesion, when seen, is very characteristic of PSC, but often not found. The main complications specific for PSC are cholangitis, cholangiocarcinoma, and end-stage liver disease. Common to other cholestatic liver diseases are complications such as fat-soluble vitamin malabsorption, pruritus, and metabolic bone disease. There is no proven medical therapy for PSC. Use of ursodeoxycholic acid at low doses of 15 mg per kilogram have been shown to improve liver enzymes, but there is no survival benefit and only questionable improvement in symptoms. In fact, it has been shown that high doses of ursodeoxycholic acid at 20 to 30 mg per kilogram can in fact be detrimental to patients with PSC as placebo-controlled trials were terminated early due to worse outcome in regards to death, need for liver transplantation, and development of varices. Palliative treatment for symptoms with endoscopic treatment of dominant strictures can be performed, but ultimately, patients who develop liver failure will require liver transplantation, and liver transplantation is therefore the only treatment and should be considered an appropriate candidate. Autoimmune hepatitis is a rare but important disease which was initially described in 1951 by Wallenstrom and Kunkel. The first description of the disease involved young girls with chronic hepatitis characterized by hypergammaglobulinemia who responded well to corticosteroids. Since then, it has become clear that this disease can affect all members of the population, although female predominance remains. A key feature of this disease has been its responsiveness to steroids. Treatment with steroids improves survival. Therefore, making the diagnosis of this disease is very important.
The diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis, however, can be quite challenging, as there is not a single test which defines autoimmune hepatitis. Rather, it requires a constellation of findings, exclusion of other liver diseases, in particular alcoholic liver disease, and viral hepatitis. The clinical presentation may be variable. There is often female predominance. Presentation can vary from acute fulminant hepatic failure to asymptomatic elevations of the liver function tests. Characteristically, the pattern is that of a hepatitic picture rather than a cholestatic picture. Common symptoms are nonspecific, with fatigue and mild right upper quadrant discomfort being the most common symptoms. The minimal required parameters to make this diagnosis include gender, serum biochemistry, that is alkaline phosphatase and ALT, serum gamma globulins, autoantibodies, including anti-nuclear antibody, smooth muscle antibody, and the liver kidney microsoma 1 antibody. One should also obtain an AMA, such that negative AMA suggests this diagnosis. In addition, there should be viral exclusion for hepatitis A, B, and C, and other viral diseases which affect the liver. One should also exclude drugs, alcohol, and personal or family history of autoimmune liver disease are helpful in making this diagnosis as patients with personal or family history are predisposed to autoimmune hepatitis. Additional parameters to help us make the diagnosis includes a liver biopsy. A liver biopsy is critical in making this diagnosis, and on liver biopsy, one sees chronic active hepatitis with interface hepatitis, rosetting, plasma cells, and lack of biliary changes. Other autoantibodies have also been associated with this disease but are less often checked include soluble liver antigen. There is also a genetic predisposition, including HLA-B8, DR3, and DR4, as well as response to steroid therapy. Most recently, the International Autoimmune Group, in an attempt to simplify the diagnosis, came up with four parameters and assigned points to them to help assist in the diagnosis. In this table, you will see the variables and assigned points. Thus, for example, in the area of autoantibodies, you should look at all the following autoantibodies, such as ANA and smooth muscle antibody. If either are greater than or equal to 1 to 40, you should assign 1 point, and if greater than 1 to 80, you should assign 2 points. If you have more than one autoantibody, the maximum number is still just two. Tallying up all the points will give you the probability of a patient having autoimmune hepatitis. Again, it is important, as you can see in its conclusion in this table, a liver biopsy is required to make the diagnosis. This is particularly important in patients that you're planning to initiate therapy, as the risk of therapy here is quite high, and therefore certainty about the diagnosis is important. For patients who have had the diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis, the determination to initiate therapy depends on the severity of the disease. Thus, a patient with severe disease has absolute indications for treatment. Severe disease can be defined as a patient with an AST of greater than 10 times normal or greater than 5 times normal but with increases in gamma globulinemia of greater than 2 times normal. These patients have only a 50% 3-year survival and a 10% 10-year survival if you do not treat them. Similarly, poor survival occurs with patients with poor histological features, and therefore these patients need to be treated as well. In contrast to the patient with severe disease, patients with mild disease, particularly in the presence of inactive cirrhosis or mild portal inflammation, may have no indications for treatment, as the risk of treatment may outweigh the potential benefit. Conventional therapy for autoimmune hepatitis includes a regimen of either prednisone alone or prednisone in conjunction with azathioprine. On this table, you can see the ASLD guidelines. It is important to recognize that patients need to be followed regularly with labs during and after treatment, as monitoring of patients with this chronic disease is particularly important. These patients often have no symptoms, and thus it is important to recognize that if there is decompensation from liver disease or flares, you will not know unless you have been monitoring them all along. With this regimen of treatment, 80% will respond to treatment and achieve remission. However, 80% will relapse after stopping therapy. Therefore, it is important to note to your patients that this is likely a diagnosis that will require lifelong immunosuppressive therapy with frequent monitoring. It is now recognized that the longer that you have your patients in remission prior to stopping their immunosuppression makes the likelihood of them maintaining remission higher. And therefore, therapy should not be stopped abruptly after initiation, and recent data suggests that not only should you wait one year, but perhaps two to four years before you taper off the medication. In summary, the three most well-characterized autoimmune liver diseases are primary biliary cirrhosis, 
primary scleral cholangitis, and autoimmune hepatitis. Primary biliary cirrhosis is a cholestatic liver disease affecting predominantly middle-aged women, presenting with pruritus, increased alkaline phosphatase, and a positive antimitochondrial antibody. The recommended treatment is ursodeoxycholic acid. Primary sclerosing cholangitis is a disease more common in men associated with ulcerative colitis, which can be diagnosed with ERCP. These patients are prone to the development of cholangial carcinoma. Autoimmune hepatitis is a disease more common in young women and can be associated with gamma globulinemia, making this difficult diagnosis is particularly important as this disease is very responsive to steroid treatment. Thank you.